Awesome. So everyone who is listening into the recording, this is cycle tracking for pregnancy. I have to adjust my screen slightly. That's not what I wanted. Here we go. So that I can see everyone. And for those on the call, Lindsay's already muted. Rachel, I'm just going to mute you in case there's any noise or feedback. And Perfect. then if you want to chime in and talk, you can either just raise your hand, let me know, or you can unmute your mic and just chime in. You're you're welcome to just interrupt as I go along if you have a question. So there's no like formalities of hand raising and in school and stuff like that, unless you want to. Awesome. So for cycle tracking for pregnancy for tonight, we're going to talk specifically about using the symptothermal method of cycle tracking to help us achieve pregnancy naturally, as well as optimizing our fertility and hormonal balance. So a lot of the work that I do here at Sauvage Wellness that I've kind of gotten known for in the, this community has been around natural birth control. But a lot of people don't realize that the same tools we teach for birth control can be used in the reverse to help us achieve pregnancy when we're ready. So that's really what we're gonna look at on today's call. For anyone who's listening in, just a little bit about me if you're new to the membership program. I am Brandy Oswald, the founder of Sauvage Wellness. I'm a certified fertility awareness instructor and cycle educator. I studied with the Natural Family Planning Teachers Association based out of the UK, and I am a current member of their teachers board as well. So I'm fully in the loop on all of the new fertility awareness info, which is kind of funny because there's not like tons of new info, right? Our bodies haven't changed since we figured all of this stuff out, which is really exciting and empowering that we learn it once and we have it for the whole rest of our lives, which is so amazing. What we're going to talk about on this call is really all about that pregnancy achievement topic. So we're going to take a look at how pregnancy happens because contrary to popular belief in health class and sex ed, it's not just about sperm and egg. There's a lot more that's happening and we're going to take a look at what that is. We'll also talk about how cycle tracking optimizes the chances of conceiving naturally, as well as how to use cycle tracking to uncover hormonal imbalances that can hinder fertility. So we're going to come at this from a few different angles. And the goal of our time together today is going to be to gain a better understanding of this symptothermal method of cycle tracking and why it is so important for pregnancy achievement. Any questions or things from anyone who's on the call before we dive right in? Cool, how cute is this little nugget on her mom's belly? I love this photo. So how does pregnancy happen? Let's talk about it. So as I mentioned, it's not just about sperm and egg. Like we were taught in health class, right? The sperm floats in, it meets the egg, and magically, amazingly, or terrifyingly, based on health class, we're pregnant. But that's not how it works. So to simplify it down for the sake of this call that we're having tonight, pregnancy has two important events. One is fertilization, which is what we learned about in sex ed and in health class, sperm meeting the egg. But there's this whole other event that takes place afterwards that is not about sperm and egg meeting. That's called implantation. We're going to dive into what exactly that means, but in order for pregnancy to be achieved, both of these things have to happen. And we need slightly different scenarios and internal environments for both of things to take place at the same time. The interesting thing is that without implantation, sperm and egg can meet, fertilization can happen, and we still won't get pregnant. So it's not as easy as them just meeting up. There's more to this puzzle, which is what we're going to really dive into on this call. So fertilization, as I mentioned, is when the sperm and egg meet in the uterine tubes immediately following ovulation. So I'm going to break this down. First of all, you maybe have never heard of uterine tubes, and that's because everyone calls them fallopian tubes. But there's this new growing movement that I support for reclaiming the name because fallopian tubes are named after this old dead white guy who decided whether or not he decided or his predecessors did that we're going to start naming pieces of the female anatomy after old dead white dudes. And that's just like lame, right? 
So instead, a lot of us are choosing to use our own terms. So I like to call them uterine tubes. I know some folks who call them egg tubes because it's they are the tubes the egg flow down after ovulation. You can call them what you want. I'm not mad if people want to call them fallopian tubes, like do you? But the term that I'll use is uterine tubes just because I like reclaiming the body as our own. So some people, folks don't realize that sperm and egg, they actually meet in your uterine tube, not in the uterus, not in the ovary, they're meeting in the tube. And that means sperm has to get all the way up into your uterine tube. So up past the uterus into the uterine tube for fertilization to happen. And then that fertilized egg has to travel all the way down the tube and into the uterus to implant itself before your period begins in order for pregnancy to take place. And that second part of it is implantation. When that fertilized egg comes down through the tubes and attaches itself to the uterine lining. And what you can see here a little bit on this diagram, the tubes are what comes out from the ovaries. This is a little bit false. Tubes aren't actually connected to the ovaries. The tube little fingers here are what attract the egg up through themselves, but it's more like a tantalizing seduction than it is a physical connection, which I also love. And so this fer fertilized egg will happen somewhere in the tube and it has to flow all the way down and implant itself into the uterine lining, the endometrium. So let's go a little bit deeper into fertilization. Rachel, did you have a question? I think I could unmute you. There you go. Yeah, I just realized you're showing like a thing. I am, yes. <laughs> I, I just, just saw it. Okay, can you so, see it on your screen now? I can now, yes. Okay, perfect. I am showing a thing. That was good, good to notice. <laughs> All the slides will be shared in the Facebook group when I share the recording as well. So you'll have access to them. Cool. So fertilization, deep dive. The fertile window is the window of time in which intercourse can lead to pregnancy. This is determined by the five day lifespan of sperm. So sperm can live for up to five days inside of our body after we've had intercourse. And then the egg is alive for 24 hours after it is released during ovulation. This creates a six day window of time during which sperm and egg can meet. And now truthfully, sperm and egg can meet only during that 24 hour period once the egg has been released, but the window is longer than that one day because sperm can hang out. So if we ovulate today, we can get pregnant from sex that happened anywhere up to five days before today. So most people are unfamiliar with this, that a lot of folks are actually getting pregnant from sex that they had leading up to ovulation, not during or after, which is pretty cool. And so fertilization happens within this window of time. And so when we are trying to get pregnant, we want to concentrate those pregnancy achievement attempts to within inside this fertile window. And that's what cycle tracking helps us do, narrow in on this window. It's really important to recognize that we only have six days at the most each month that intercourse can lead to pregnancy. And again, these are the five days leading up to ovulation and the 24 hours immediately following. For folks who have irregular cycles, so periods that only come every couple of months, you will have even fewer days every month. This is because in one cycle from period to period, if you have three months in between those two periods, you will only have one fertile window in that three month cycle. So only one six day window of time in that three month cycle that you can get pregnant. So that's why it's huge for folks with those irregular periods to be tracking their cycles to really hone in on those six days so they don't miss them. Because in fact, it won't be six days every month for them. It will be six days every cycle. And if the cycle is three months long, then it's six days in those three months. Now, 
And so I want to take a second to talk about what exactly triggers ovulation. Like why, why does it happen? What allows it to take place? So the first thing that happens is we have low estrogen while we're on our periods. While we're on our periods, estrogen is the lowest it will be all cycle long. And this low estrogen level triggers the production of follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. FSH will then stimulate the growth of ovarian follicles or eggs. And then as the eggs begin to grow inside the ovaries, those eggs will make your estrogen. So maturing eggs are making estrogen in preparation for ovulation. Those rising levels of estrogen from the maturing eggs stimulate the production of cervical fluid. So it's those maturing eggs that are making your estrogen that tells your cervix to make cervical fluid. And all of this is in preparation for ovulation. And the cervical fluid is what allows the sperm to be really mobile and to live inside of our bodies for that five-day lifespan. As the eggs are maturing and creating estrogen, eventually they will reach a maturation point and estrogen will peak. That peak in estrogen will trigger a spike in luteinizing hormone or LH. This is what people are trying to detect with those ovulation strips is the LH spike. But ovulation strips can provide multiple LH high readings in one cycle. So we really need to be cycle tracking to make sure that that LH spike lines up with cervical fluid and temperature because the LH strips on their own can be less reliable. So once LH spikes, this triggers ovulation. And ovulation is that release of the egg from the ovary. So there's a lot of hormonal shifts that are happening, all building up into one another to create ovulation. And we can see this, we can track this on a paper cycle tracking chart and use it to get pregnant, to help us optimize and understand where we are in our cycle. I wanna take a second to talk about the importance of cervical fluid. Anyone who's worked with me one-on-one -on -one knows that my all-time favorite cycle tracking tool is cervical fluid. Before I was an educator and a, trained to teach this method, for years and years and years, the only thing that I used as natural birth control was cervical fluid tracking. That was the only thing. I didn't use temperature. I didn't use a paper chart. I learned how to track cervical fluid really efficiently. And cervical fluid is such a powerful tool for both birth control and pregnancy. In fact, it is necessary for getting pregnant. And that is because cervical fluid acts as a sperm roadmap. I always joke that cervical fluid is the Google Maps for sperm. The old um, sexist analogy that men have are always needing to pull over and ask for directions, but they're too stubborn to do it. That like plays out true with sperm. So sperm are like, they have no idea where they are. They don't wanna pull over for directions. They'll drive around in circles before they figure anything out. But cervical fluid shows up and goes, oh my God, let me show you how to do this. And it just creates a beautiful interstate for them to travel on and gives them all of the directions that they need. And so the wet, slippery cervical fluid that our body makes leading up to ovulation is what sperm needs to be really efficient at moving itself up towards the egg for transportation and mobility. I also love that the vagina on its own without cervical fluid is a sperm murderer. Hilarious. I love that so much. I love that for us. So our body's like, You're, you, we didn't make you, what are you doing here? Except for when we make fertile cervical fluid. So that wet, slippery cervical fluid is what allows sperm to survive in the acidic environment of the vagina. Without cervical fluid present, the vagina is far too acidic to support sperm life. So cool. 
We have our own little sperm filtration device. <laughs> Cervical fluid is also really interesting, and I didn't include it on this slide, but there are types of cervical fluid that can help filter out sperm. So sperm that have little bent, broken tails or that don't travel effectively or are swimming in circles, the ones that are like less optimal for reproduction, cervical fluid can help filter those out and they send them off on the wrong exits so that they don't get to where we want them to go. Isn't that so cool? Who knew all that amazing stuff was happening? I also love the rhetoric in our society that, you know, men love to talk about like, my sperm is so strong and sperm this and my sperm is so virile and like this like big macho talk. Meanwhile, vaginas and cervical fluid are like, that's so cute that you think that. So questions or thoughts on fertilization, cervical fluid, or anything we've talked about up to the point of implantation. Well, I guess I'm curious why, if, if there's reasoning why the vagina murders the sperm otherwise. Is, is it just because you don't, we, it doesn't wanna, it, it's a foreign object or a foreign, like thing up there like is there any reason why you wouldn't want it in there like I just yeah. was curious yeah so there are a few reasons so after we ovulate the cervical fluid as you've experienced and Rachel may have noticed this too it turns into something that's a little bit more thick and tacky if anything and that like thicker consistency is to keep sperm from getting into the cervix because that's our body going we already ovulated. So we could be getting pregnant this month. And if we are, we don't want any extra sperm up there causing any issues. We want our body to be in a nice pure state for whatever pregnancy might be coming. And similar things happen when we are pregnant, we create that mucus plug, that's a cervical mucus plug. And that keeps stuff from getting into the really delicate area of the uterus where the baby's forming. And so our cervix does that on a lower grade level during our regular menstrual cycles as well. And then another reason for this is just that we're not near ovulation. So there's no reason for our body to have sperm that far up, right? Like there's no biological or primal reason that we would be using it and, there, and our body recognizes that. So it just says, we don't need you right now. So we're just gonna be done with you. As well as things like we know sperm can I mean, they carry their own DNA, they can carry their own diseases, things like that. So it's just helpful for the body to flush that out if we're not using it actively. And if there was a pregnancy developing, it wouldn't want to like distract or like take any energy away from like that potential pregnancy. Like right, exactly. Pregnancy. That's cool. Yeah. And also some folks don't realize, but so the vagina, a lot of us know, has its own pH levels. If anyone's ever had a yeast infection or a bacteria infection in your vagina, you know that when it's off, it really is awful and is uncomfortable. And so another reason to kill off sperm really quickly is that sperm changes the pH of our vagina. So some women will experience things like yeast infections or irritation after intercourse if there's no pulling out. And that's because sperm literally changes our pH temporarily which is kind of cool to, to at least know, right? Cool. So we'll take a look now at the next part, implantation after fertilization has happened. So implantation, as we talked about, is that next phase where the fertilized egg implants itself into the uterine lining. And we need about 10 to 16 days after ovulation before our period starts again for fertilized egg to be able to implant into the lining. This part of the cycle from ovulation to the start of your period is called the luteal phase. And if there's not enough time in the luteal phase, the fertilized egg will get flushed out as our period or reabsorbed into the body. So we need to have enough time for that journey down out of the tube into the uterus and attaching itself, which takes a series of days. And we know that that's generally around the 10 day mark that we need for that luteal phase. So folks who struggle with getting pregnant, 
it may not always be about fertilization, about sperm and egg. It could simply be about this luteal phase. And when the luteal phase is shorter than 10 days, we call that luteal phase defect. And it sounds really harsh. And the modern medicine world gets really intricate into treatments and medications and things like that. But I have literally seen women, myself included, correct a luteal phase defect with simple things like food and herbs and stress management and self-care. Because so much can impact this phase of our cycle from things like diet, stress, exercise, medications. And so luteal phase defect is not the end of the world. It's really easy to work with, but first we have to know if that's what's going on. And so this phase is huge because without implantation, without enough time after ovulation, fertilized egg may have happened, but it doesn't implant and it doesn't have the ability to turn into a pregnancy. So what do we need for implantation to take place other than just 10 to 16 days? The first is a thickened uterine lining. If our uterine lining is too thin, there's nothing for the egg to attach to. This is one function of hormonal birth control is that it thins out our uterine lining so that any fertilized egg, should it have happened, doesn't have a space to connect to. In order to have that thickened lining, we need to have adequate levels of estrogen before we ovulate. So we need to have estrogen growing that uterine lining, which is one of the things that the estrogen before ovulation does. As we talked about earlier, the maturing eggs make estrogen, which triggers your cervix to make cervical fluid. But another thing that that estrogen does is trigger your uterine lining to thicken. And that thickened uterine lining is literally what becomes your period when you get your period. You're starting to shed that tissue out so you can grow a new lining every cycle. Another thing we need is or progesterone dominance after ovulation. So this is to say that after we ovulate, we need progesterone to be the dominant hormone. We need it to overpower estrogen because progesterone is what will keep our uterine lining in place for implantation to happen. It's what, it, it's what prevents the uterine lining from letting go and turning into our period. So diving into that a little bit deeper, the importance of progesterone, again, is to hold that uterine lining in place, among other things like preventing PMS and heavy periods and all the other things that everybody hates about their period, progesterone is pretty much the key to having an easier period flow. But it also holds our uterine lining in place. And so without those adequate levels of progesterone after ovulation, the uterine lining can let go too early and prevent implantation from happening. In signs of this early release can look like spotting before our period begins and less than 10 days between ovulation and the period itself. Questions on implantation. It's the one we hear less about in the education world. So let's talk about how to use cycle tracking to optimize all of this, to optimize natural conception. For anyone who's watching the video, I know Rachel and Lindsay are familiar, but here on the right-hand side, this is what a cycle tracking chart looks like. This is what we learn how to do and how to use and how to read when we work on tracking our cycles. And this is the same chart that we use for birth control and for pregnancy. This is actually the same chart you did for homework recently, Lindsay. <laughs> we just looked at it today. <laughs> so what is the symptothermal method of cycle tracking? That is what I teach at Sauvage Wellness. That is what I use. That is what I love. The symptothermal method is a specialized form of cycle tracking that is one of many forms of fertility awareness methods. Fertility awareness methods, for those who are unfamiliar, are methods of birth control and pregnancy support that are based on observation of real-time fertility signs. Fertility awareness methods got really popular in the book, Taking Charge of Your Fertility, 
Though in that book, she is talking about the symptothermal method. It's important to know there are other types of fertility awareness methods. With the symptothermal method, we can do so much. Not only are we using it as natural birth control to help us get pregnant and to help us have better periods, but we also can use it to know which phase of the cycle we're in. We can use it to locate our unique fertile window because where my fertile window happens in my cycle will likely be different than where yours happens. And where our fertile window is this month, it may be slightly different next month. So it's important to know exactly what's happening in each cycle. With this method, we can also know if and when we've ovulated. We can spot hormonal imbalance and we can optimize our fertility. When we're using the symptothermal method, we keep track of four things. The cervical fluid, basal body temperature, which is a really fancy way of saying your temperature right when you wake up in the morning. And then some two optional ones, cervix changes. So spoiler alert, you can reach into your body with clean hands and feel your cervix. It's right there waiting for you. It's not just a thing for doctors to talk about or touch when you're getting vaginal exams. In fact, you're allowed to tell them you don't want them to touch your cervix, but you have the power. And if you work with me, I'll teach you how to do it. It's right there waiting. I actually just checked mine yesterday. Just for fun, just make sure it's still there. And then actually I didn't check it for fun. I'll teach you why I checked it. My period was late this month and I wasn't nervous about being pregnant. I just was annoyed that it wasn't happening. So I reached up to check my cervix to see if there was any little blood right around it that would tell me it's coming, it's just not here yet. And there was, and so I could go on with my life and be like, okay, it's starting, it's just having a slower start. So how cool is that? Instead of walking around throughout the world being super nervous about where's my period, you can just reach in, give it a tap and see if anything's starting to come out because it will start at your cervix before it descends, it takes a little while, a day or two to descend out of your body. But you can life hack it and reach up there and see what you find. So cool. So then I got to be chill for the rest of the day and not worry about it. And then the last one is body symptoms, things like breast tenderness, ovulation pressure, um, different, different things, energy, fatigue, things like that that can line up with the different phases of our cycle. And so how do we use all of this cycle tracking information to get pregnant? So we can use it to open our fertile window by using cervical fluid reading. That's how we open the window. We can use it to identify our peak fertile cervical fluid days, right? Because we know we have to have cervical fluid present and the right kind of cervical fluid to support that sperm lifespan. We can use cervical fluid and temperature to close our fertile window to know when we're at the end of that fertile time. And you're welcome to keep having sex, right? That's great. But just knowing that those attempts won't lead to pregnancy, those are just for you to have some fun. And then we can use cycle tracking to isolate those pregnancy achievement attempts to inside of our fertile window. So rather than just blindly winging it, I just heard this term yesterday, I'm just gonna go off birth control and wing it. Great, but know that it, you might come to me like nine months later being like, where the hell is my baby? And that's because if we're winging it, we might just not ever get in that six day window. We have 31 days every month we could simply be missing that time. And so it's important to really hone in on when that is. And so cervical fluid, is this what's next? Okay, cool. Cervical fluid can tell us a lot. It can show us if estrogen is too high or too low in the different phases of our cycle. It can tell us when to open up our fertile window. Literally overnight, it tells us, okay, you're in your fertile window. And it is crucial again for sperm mobility in lifespan. And I love cervical fluid. She is the queen of our menstrual cycle and is so underrated. Temperature, which is the one everyone loves and everyone goes to first because it's the easiest to do. We just pop a thermometer in once a day and go on with our lives. Temperature can show us if progesterone is too low after ovulation because temperature rises in response to progesterone. So there's a really close relationship there. 
Temperature can show us if estrogen is too high after ovulation, meaning there's not enough progesterone to balance it out. Temperature can help us close the fertile window and confirm that we did ovulate. And temperature is what will show us if the luteal phase is long enough for implantation to happen. So we need both of these tools together, cervical fluid and temperature, to access all the information that we need about our fertile window, our sex hormones, and the pre and post ovulatory phases. Number one question I get, but how is cycle tracking different than ovulation strips? Like why can't I just go pee on these strips once a day and just get pregnant that way? For some people that totally works and for others it doesn't and it can be really frustrating and expensive because those strips aren't cheap. And so ovulation strips, they simply detect that rise in LH or luteinizing hormone that we talked about earlier. And a positive ovulation strip or a rise in LH is not necessarily a guarantee of ovulation. It does tell us that our body's trying to ovulate, but for some folks, not every attempt to ovulation actually follows through and results in ovulation. Sometimes our body takes a few attempts to get there, especially if we're newly off of hormonal birth control, if we have a history of irregular cycles, or if we're just having an odd month where we're really stressed out or we started new medication or we were traveling. So not every positive LH strip is a guarantee of ovulation, but what is, is seeing that rise in temperature, which we learn how to track with cycle tracking. So if you get an LH rise and it lines up with the temperature rise, that is great confirmation of ovulation. And we need to see these things together. Questions, thoughts on cycle tracking, for pregnancy achievement before we move into using it to uncover hormonal imbalance? I don't know if you're going to talk about this later on, but I was just curious if there was kind of like, like during that, your fertile, that, that five or six days we're talking about, should, should you have sex every day or should it be like only a certain amount of days? Like, I didn't know if there was like, mm -hmm. you know, rhyme or reason to that part of it. I didn't know if you were going to talk about that later, but I was just kind of curious. No, I, I wasn't planning on it. So we can talk about it now for sure. So all the traditional like ways of going about it, the doctors, offices, all that stuff, they generally do an every other day situation. And my guess is that if we're looking for the fertile window, the every other day kind of gets us close without knowing for sure whether or not we're in that window. When we're cycle tracking to get pregnant, if you know you're in your fertile window, you can start trying as early as you'd like. Now, as you know, Lindsay, because you've been tracking, we open our fertile window with the appearance of cervical fluid, but often those very early days maybe outside of that actual six day window to conceive. It's just telling our body, okay, we're getting ready. Start trying because it's coming soon. But sometimes those early days aren't quite in the window. So the general recommendation is start trying when your fertile window opens, but to really optimize and take advantage of the peak fluid days. And the peak fluid days are that those egg white fluid days. So for anyone who's unfamiliar, the peak fertile cervical fluid looks like raw egg whites. It's clear and slippery. You can pull it between your fingers. It literally looks like you cracked open an egg and took the yolk out. That is really fertile fluid for sperm mobility. And so we say when you're looking to conceive, we want to really optimize those stretchy and egg white type of days. So concentrating to those days is really the best, most effective way to prioritize pregnancy achievement attempts. And then I'll, I don't offer this information publicly. I'll offer like where to find it if you're interested. But in that book, Taking Charge of Your Fertility, there is some information on lifespan and hardiness of male sperm versus female sperm. So like sperm that turns into little girls or little boys. And Mind you, we're having this, this discussion like outside of the realm of like trans culture. So I want to be representative that like we're just talking the birth sex of a baby, whatever they become as an adult, that's outside of the bounds of this conversation right now. 
And, you know, I love it and I'm open to all the things. However, when we're talking about the medical determination of sex with sperm, X or Y sperm, there is some research that depending on where we have sex in our fertile window, we can with up to like 70% effectiveness determine the birth sex of our babies. And I do know a woman whose parents wanted a girl, they followed this method, they learned how to have a baby girl and then they did. So if you, my mom calls it playing God, if you want to play God with the sex of your baby, there is information out there and I'm not going to offer it up on this call because not everybody wants to know how to do it. Um, but where you have sex inside your fertile window can to some level of accuracy potentially determine the sex of a baby. Crazy, amazing, not necessary to have that info, not 100% accurate either. But that's another reason for concentrating intercourse at certain parts of the fertile window. Cool, and I will tell you, if anyone's thinking about looking that information up, my fiance and I now are in the predicament of we can't unknow that information since it was taught to me in school. <laughs> so there is that, you're burdened with not ever being able to unknow it. <laughs> So let's take a look at cycle tracking to uncover hormonal imbalance. First off, I wanna talk about common period symptoms that can be signs of potential hormonal imbalance. And these are things that we've been taught as you start to read down the list are just normal for periods, but they're actually not. They can be signs that something underlying is off. And so a big red flag is heavy periods. If we're bleeding through pads or tampons in more than two hours, we want to take a look at what is causing such a heavy period. And often there's a hormonal imbalance underlying it. Long periods that go on for more than five or seven days can also be a sign that something's out of balance. We talked about spotting before the period begins, which can be a sign of that short luteal phase or progesterone being too low and releasing the uterine lining early. Feeling like a PMS monster, that's, that's not normal. If that happens, there's something underlying that, and we want to take a look at that imbalance as well, including things like mood swings, bloating, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of some of these is, is normal and common. Our body's going through a lot at this time, but if we're feeling like raging mood swings, our pants no longer fit, we have to eat all the cookies in the house, and we need to go on a gentle murder spree, like those things aren't normal, right? So if, if we're feeling that, we're likely looking at some potential underlying imbalance. And that's important because it has an impact on our fertility. The same imbalances that cause heavy periods, long periods, spotting, PMS, all of that stuff can impact our fertility. So it doesn't just have an impact on our period. If we have shitty periods, we will likely have some issues around fertility. Not always, but it may be an early sign of that. So having a period that sucks is a red flag to start nourishing your menstrual cycle in support of fertility. And so these period symptoms are really often a result of having excess estrogen and or low progesterone in the luteal phase of the cycle after ovulation. And this type of imbalance specifically can lead to implantation issues. And we see this really commonly in folks when they first start cycle tracking to achieve pregnancy. The main cycle tracking signs of cervical fluid and temperature can also help us spot hormonal imbalance. And cervical fluid, again, can show us if estrogen is low. Basically, if we're not making a lot of cervical fluid, estrogen might be too low. And we know that because estrogen is what tells the body to make cervical fluid. Cervical fluid can also show us if there's an estrogen excess. After we've ovulated, estrogen goes on a decline and therefore cervical fluid should dry up. But if it doesn't, there may still be an excess of estrogen present, which is important to know about in that luteal phase. And cervical fluid can also give us clues about delayed ovulation. If we're not having a cervical fluid peak day until later in the cycle, 
20 or 30 days in, that tells us that we're not ovulating on that day 14 mark that, you know, everyone everywhere tells us we're supposed to be ovulating. It's fine if you're not ovulating right on day 14. I rarely do. But if we're ovulating later in the cycle, in the 20 day range, and we're following the generalized Western medicine rule of we ovulate on day 14, then we're going to concentrate our attempts around day 14 and completely miss our actual fertile window because we have a slightly delayed ovulation. Cervical fluid can help us see that and actually get to our real fertile window, which is why it's important to disregard that day 14 rule and actually figure out when do you ovulate? When is your actual fertile window? From there, temperature is also telling us a lot about potential hormonal imbalance. It can show us if there's an estrogen progesterone imbalance after we ovulate, because if temperature rise is unnoticeable or up and down and kind of sporadic, that can tell us there's not enough progesterone to stabilize our temperatures after we ovulate. Temperature also helps us spot delayed ovulation. If the temperature rise is way late in our cycle, that tells us, okay, we didn't ovulate until that rise happened later in our cycle. Temperature can also tell us if ovulation just didn't happen at all. If there was no temperature rise in the cycle, then there was no progesterone being made. And we only make progesterone if we ovulate. Therefore, if there wasn't a temperature rise, there may not have been ovulation. And then temperature can tell us if we have a short luteal phase. If we only have eight or nine high temperatures before our period begins, then that's simply not enough high temperatures, not enough time in the luteal phase for implantation to occur. And we can literally see all of this information just by tracking our cycles. It's so powerful. Imagine if women seeking fertility treatments had access to five or six months, even two months of cycle tracking charts before they went in seeking that medical intervention, they may have been able to spot what was happening in their cycle. And rather than trying different solutions out of thin air and hoping and grasping that they work, they could go in and say, this is what I know is happening in my cycle. I can see it right here. So I need support for this specific issue. And we actually are able to then access personalized fertility support versus the generalized stuff of take Clomid or take this medication, or now it's time for IUI, or now it's time for this we can get at what we're seeing, address our personalized struggles first, and then if we need some of those other interventions, we can pursue them then. So before I get into what's up next, I'll even go back to slide. Thoughts, questions on how our periods, our cervical fluid and our temperature help to expose potential underlying imbalance. Anything surprising? And there doesn't have to be. I know when I first learned this, so I use cycle tracking a little bit of my story for a very long time. I'm 31 and I first learned how to use it when I was 23. So when everyone tells you that young people can't use cycle tracking is birth control, they can fuck right off because I taught myself at 23. So that's just not true. If young people want to, and they have the dedication and the responsibility to, they absolutely can use this effectively. And I used this method for a long time, probably five or six years, just as birth control without knowing all this other information. And then I started to experience really severe menstrual cycle issues very, very heavy periods, terrifyingly heavy periods. I ruined a brand new mattress one time. It was a very traumatic experience. I started having the world's worst cramps, begging to go to the emergency room. I was having cystic acne all over my face, which I'd never had before, on my back, on my chest. Anxiety was through the roof. And I was spotting at all these different times. When I went to doctors, the only option was, oh, birth control pills. It fixes everything. And I knew at the time, because I had been on birth control before, that it doesn't fix anything. It just stops everything, right? It just puts our cycle on pause 
and says, we'll pick this back up later when we get to it. And I didn't want to pause anything. I wanted to fix it because these symptoms weren't what I was used to. Something was causing them. And so I went home. I had no help. You know, doctors didn't actually give me anything useful. And they sent me home and said, well, if you're not going to take the pill or you're not going to get the IUD, there's nothing we can do for you. So I went back to my charts to see what I could figure out. And that's when I realized that I could see what was happening right on my charts to understand what was going on in my body. And I literally could spot that progesterone was too low and that estrogen was way too high. And once I spotted that and I changed up my diet and I introduced a few herbs and a few supplements, everything changed, everything. My luteal phase got longer. My periods are so light, they're three days long, it's amazing. I have very mild cramps, my acne is gone. And if I took the pill, it just would have paused all of that. But instead I went to the charts, I found the imbalance and I fixed it. And so now as a 31 year old woman who's looking into getting pregnant in the next few years, that imbalance is healed. And my fertility is where it needs to be for pregnancy to happen. Had I gone on the pill four or five years ago when I had this imbalance, and I stayed on it until I wanted to get pregnant, that imbalance would still be there when I took the pill away. And I would likely have found myself in a doctor's office seeking fertility treatments. When really simple paper charting of cervical fluid and temperature held the answer. And that won't be the case for everyone, but imagine the number of people that it could potentially be the case for that are undergoing unnecessary treatment when the answer is right there in our bodies. All we need to do is know how to look for it. I love how empowering it is to have access to all of this information. Gives us our power back and our ability to advocate for ourselves and for what our body's asking for. So cool. So then what's next? From here, this is just the beginning, right? Just the exposure to what is possible with cycle tracking when it comes time for pregnancy achievement. The next step is to actually learn how to use the method, how to track your cervical fluid, how to track your temperature, and how to read and analyze those charts to identify your fertile window, to uncover if there's any potential imbalances in your cycle, and how to optimize your natural fertility, how to take care of those imbalances, and how to really harness your fertile phases. And so, Spoiler alert, I have a whole course about this. How exciting. So this is called Conceive with Confidence, which is literally a lifelong goal of mine to help women conceive confidently rather than the way we go about it now in our modern world, which is going into wanting to get pregnant and just winging it, right? Which is what we've been taught. In health class and sex ed and doctor's appointments, we've spent most of our life being taught how to not get pregnant. But no one ever sat us down to teach us how. When we wanna get pregnant, how do we do it? And that's what we need to know. And that's what this course will teach us. How do we get pregnant when we're ready? And so how can we embark on this journey with confidence? Because getting pregnant should be something that feels exciting. A time that's filled with joy and confidence and knowledge about our bodies versus a time that feels confusing and frustrating and like we're in the dark. And so that's what this course is here to do. In, it's a four module course. And so in this course, you'll learn how to track cervical fluid temperature and cervix, how to identify your unique fertile window, how to confirm and locate ovulation, how to use your fertile cervical fluid, how to try at the right time, right? Just the simple act of trying at the right time can make all the difference. You'll also learn how to uncover those potential cycle imbalances. And two of my favorites that get often overlooked are how to use really easy natural things like food and movement and lifestyle and supplement support to optimize our own fertility. And then how to use cycle tracking charts when talking to your doctors. Because spoiler alert, most doctors can't read cycle charts. They have no idea what they're, what they're telling us. So we have to show them. 
we have to show them what's going on in our bodies, what we know to be true. And in this course, I'll teach you how to do that without hopefully pissing off your doctors, but that's okay. If they get mad, it just means there's more to learn and they're a little cranky about that. That's okay. And so there's, when you get these slides, you'll be able to click to learn more about the course. It's also up on my website. I think this is the end. Oh, oh, I'm giving you a gift. Oh, amazing. So I do so many workshops that I forget what I'm giving people. So you can learn more about the course and as a gift for you, if you're interested about the course, I always want to create an opportunity for you to chat with me one on one. So whether you're live on the call or listening to the recording, when you get these slides, you can click this link to book now and pop a time on my calendar for 30 minutes. Just chat with me. We'll talk about your unique situation to see if this course even makes sense for you and to make sure you get the right cycle support for your cycle. And so I want to offer that up to everyone. This is in addition to the office hour calls that you get as a member. This is a time just to talk about conceiving. And if the course is something you're interested in, to make sure it makes sense for you and for what you're needing. I'm so excited about Conceive with Confidence. It's the first time I've offered the coursework in terms of getting pregnant aside from my one-on-one -on -one work. And I can tell you, there are real life little humans right now out in the world that are a result of Sauvage Wellness which is so cool. And I've gotten to meet some of them and they are the result of being at workshops like this, of learning this information. So if you're interested, definitely set up a time. I would absolutely love to chat more. I'm going to stop the screen share for folks who are live here on the call. I'm going to end the recording and then open it up to both of you for questions, comments, and we can explore a little bit further um, anything that we want to together. So anyone who's listening to the recording, I love you. You're amazing. Mwah. Schedule your one-on-one -on -one calls. I hope to see you soon. Beautiful.